Welcome, folks, to this uh, Facebook Live. I am Ravi Tangri, and I have uh, today as my guest Patricia Morgan, who I'm going to in introduce. This today's Facebook Live is about, uh, in general, first of all, dealing with the pandemic and the isolation and the lockdown. And more specifically, for those of us in Nova Scotia, for those connected to what's been happening in Nova Scotia, where we had the mass shooting less than a week ago, uh, about how do we work through our grief and how do we move through the sadness in, into this. Uh, so my guest is a dear friend uh, from uh, my professional association, the Canadian Association of Professional Speakers, out of Calgary, Patricia Morgan, who's counselor and an expert on resilience. Now, what um, the one thing, Patricia, I just wanted to show you when when I was uh, national president, I should mention of CAPS. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, Patricia was president of the Calgary chapter, and part of what I had to do was go across the country, visit each chapter. Oh, those were the days, right? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and uh, speak with, at the chapter and such. And Patricia was the most amazing uh, host when I, when I came to Calgary. When I arrived, she brought me to the hotel, and waiting in the room was uh, a bag with a care package of all sorts of amazing stuff, including... <laughs> This little guy, <laughs> it's Patricia, I still have, he's sitting on my bookshelf. I call him CC for Calgary Cup. And uh, that was the start of, a, of an incredible weekend with the Calgary chapter. So thank you, Patricia. So welcome. Well, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for the invitation. And perhaps you could tell them a little bit more about your own background, where you're, uh, and how you've come into working in this area of resilience. Well, I had a pretty messed up life myself. I won't get into too much of it. Uh, primarily because of a dad who returned from the Second World War with undiagnosed post-traumatic stress disorder. So I've had a fair bit of my own therapy. And after a number of years of that, I ended up with a master's degree in clinical psychology. It is my privilege to support people in attending to any of their leftover trauma, their wounds, their lack of confidence, uh, their pain. And I know right now my heart goes out to you, Ravi. I know you had a friend who uh, was in this awful incident that happened in Halifax. And I feel privileged also that I have some tools and skills to support people, whether it's in recent trauma or past trauma. Thank you, Patricia. And so I do want to get into that in terms specifically with the deep levels, as I say, of grief, of sadness that are happening here in Nova Scotia. And also, I should mention, for those of you who are watching, if you've got questions, if you've got thoughts, if you've got um, insights or experiences, things that you're working with or questions, put them into the chat. This is uh, live casting right now, both to YouTube and Facebook. Uh, so you can put the, the, the chat uh, in either of the comments in either of those places, and we'll be able to bring that into the conversation so that we can address them. So, before we get into the specifics of the deeper grief that's going on here, Patricia, could yeah. you share, I'm curious, what has been coming up for you with your counseling practice? What are the sort of things that people are coming to you with and asking for help? I'm, I'm really curious what people are reaching out to you for. Well, it's interesting. There's uh, sort of two pools of it. I, I myself, to backtrack a little bit, had never done online counseling and I had a steep learning curve. It's called tech, technology-assisted technology counseling. There, I got it out of my mouth. Technology-assisted counseling. Uh, so I had to have new consent forms. Um, I had to learn how to do counseling online and then I needed to learn how to use the platform. So high learning curve for me. And I had about 16 new people come to me because of this stressful time. The two buckets that I'm experiencing are those people that already had a stress bucket 
of trauma or um, tendencies for anxiety, for fear, for depression. Dumping this coronavirus situation on top of it was an overspill for them. And wisely, friends or relatives would say, Patricia, have you got time in your schedule to be able to connect with these folks? The other pool of people, which I also find very, I find them actually quite interesting, have said, oh, I've got time on my hands. I have a phobia to driving. Or, oh, that incident about um, somebody breaking into my house five years ago. I, sometimes I have sleepless nights and I have a nightmare about it. I've got time now to do some introspection. So those are the two main categories of people that I've ended up supporting. Um, the one person who's got to really take care of herself is a frontline nurse that I'm supporting. And she needed to develop some coping mechanism because every time she went to work, her stress bucket got bigger and bigger. Uh, and she couldn't just stay at home with it. So at each person, depending on their circumstance, came to counseling to attend to some need. I, I can only imagine if, if you're in, uh, you know, if you're working in healthcare now, it's, it's mm -hmm. uh, I, sus I, I suspect what we're going to find down the road, yeah. a lot of cases of PTSD and such that are going to be developing. Yes. Well, it was an interesting strategy we developed with her was we, I said, are you going to make the sign or am I going to make a sign? And it was a sign she put in her car in the parking lot to remind her when she got into the car that all is well, she is fine, and she can shake off her hyper alertness. She has to be, if, if health people had to be on task, focused, paying attention to their own safety and their patient safety. It has been elevated like like huge. So we put in some strategies of a routine for her to kind of shake off that hyper alertness and tension that is actually required in the workplace when she goes home to her sweetheart and her dog. Right. Now, what about for people now who are you know, they're, they're in isolation, they're, they're, there's all of this. I think the biggest thing, thing here, the challenge, is the uncertainty. Yes. Because we don't know when this is going to end this. We don't know what's going to happen when, you know, what the new normal is. When, we, you know, we can't go okay. back after lockdown to what normal was because the virus mm -hmm. will still be around. We still have to socially distance. So, so much uncertainty. Uh, any thoughts on how people can work with that, work through that. Well, Eckhart Tolle wrote the book, The Power of Now. Uh, uncertainty has to, an anxiety, and often it has to do with imagining the worst, moving into the future. And definitely we are dealing with uncertainty. And for control freaks, oh my goodness, a couple of people I'm uh, dealing with or supporting, I should say dealing with, supporting, um, tend to want to have all their P's and Q's in a line and their future all organized. So it was a huge challenge for them. So lots of practicing what's going on right now. How's your breathing right now? Look around the room. Is everything okay right now? We tend to go, have, if we have past trauma, we can tend to have that creep up on us with flashbacks. And if we are one of those people that believe that we can create everything in our future, and determined to do it that way, we can also creating anxiety and worry, worry, wart, worry, wart. As uh, the Governor General of Alberta years ago said, Lois Hall, 99% of what you worry about doesn't happen, and the other 1% you have no control over. So control what you can. I love the serenity prayer. Grant me the serenity to accept what I cannot change, the courage to change what I can and the wisdom to know the difference. Okay. <laughs> the other thing here is people are going through grief already, not even getting into specifics here. That's right. But because of all those routines that are gone, what do we need to do to honor that and to move through that? Right. Well, that's a very good question. Because I was going to say not only uncertainty, but loss. 
huge loss. People are losing their jobs. Some, some people are losing uh, the, the ability to pay their, their rent. They're losing money. Uh, they're watching their investments. Loss, loss, loss. Uh, they're losing connection with other people. This whole physical distancing. Many people are losing confidence because uh, if you don't use a particular skill over and over again, they're losing routine. And uh, I hate to make it a cliche, but we're back almost to the uh, serenity prayer again. Plus, acknowledge your feelings. I know that, that it too sounds cliche. Please find safe people. Use the phone, use technology. I remember I, back when, well, I don't actually remember it, but my mother and father met and three months later, he went to war. And, and my mom received a letter maybe every two to three months for three years. Then he came and they got married. If this pandemic had happened in, in those times where we sent letters to connect, we would be in like triple trouble. But look at you and I, we get messages from one another, Ravi, through our facial expressions and our, mwah, our all our body, like 80% of how we communicate is this, is this facial stuff. And I've been teaching people that are feeling the loss of connection. And I think loss of connection is the biggest uh, issue that if we could handle it, the others calm down because we're social beings and we are hardwired for connection. And the skin is the largest organ in the body. We had people in senior homes that weren't touched and they died because they weren't touched. And that's why we started bringing animals into senior residents. And now th that's all complicated. So I've been teaching, trying to teach the world to do what's called the butterfly hug. And it, you can do it on tapping on your shoulders or tapping here on your biceps. And you picture somebody that you're missing dearly and you build in your mind connection and you get your touching needs met and you're loving somebody that's you. Mm -hmm. That's one. The, the, another thing someone told me, I, I'm forgetting what the discipline was, is where you put your hands like this and then bring it in here close. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And hold that for 20, 30 seconds more. Yeah. And that can trigger the similar internal feelings to actually being hugged. Right. Yeah, that's another, uh, that's from uh, Brain Gym. Okay. Yeah. Both, the whole brain. <laughs> both, yeah. both, both of those moves give a sense of uh, right, right, left brain stimulation, uh, connection to self. It doesn't really matter. You need to get, get yourself in touch with yourself and then image that person that you're missing. So at the end of my counseling sessions now, we're doing virtual hugs, right? Like this. Right. And I, you, you and I know CAPS, our association is a huggy association. Uh, it's, uh, and I, for me, I, it's, it's interesting. I'm isolating alone in the house. Right. So it, it's really interesting. And I'm slightly on the introvert scale. So it's, it's like I need my space to recharge. So mostly it's okay, but I've noticed the last couple of weeks, oh my God, I am really, really starting to feel the right. lack of physical connection. Right, and by the way, uh, anybody that has an introverted preference, please don't feel guilty for enjoying some me time. <laughs> uh, and Robbie, you're echoing quite a, somewhat. Okay. Right? And your sound is like double the, the loudness of me. Just so you know. Okay, I had gotten a comment that my mic was low, so I just switched it, that's all. So I will switch it back. Good to, good to, uh, good to know that. Now, Patricia, what the introvert part, that what do you do for extroverts? Uh -huh. A little louder, Ravi. How can extroverts? Say that again. Hang on. Yeah. We will get a little glitch. <laughs> we will get this. Of course. Uh, one thing. Is that better? Yes. Yeah. 
how can extroverts survive this? Because they're going wackadoodle. <laughs> I'm a raving extrovert. I'm a raving extrovert. So I've made videos and I make phone calls. And of course, um, I put out the offer for counseling and said I was available. And that's been satisfying um, my need for, for a connection. So I really, yes, and extroverts use all that technology, reach out, uh, volunteer to phone seniors, phone your, phone your grandkids. Um, yeah, you need connection. It's uh, how you figure out how to be in the world. Like, I don't know what I think till somebody asks me a question like you, Ravi. And I go, oh, oh, I hear myself talking. I must think that. So you are okay. my introverted, introverted husband. You ask him a question and he has to walk around the block for uh, an hour before he, you know, sorts out how he's going to answer. So in internal yeah. feeling and the external feeling. So, yes, me reach out so uh, patricia this is going to be louder for you i've gotten getting feedback on the comments that the other mic wasn't working for them this one does the, but so what else can extroverts do when they you know we can reach out on zoom and such but what else can they do to stop from crawling up the walls <laughs> well um now you've asked me a question i I've, I've never really given many much thought to i have a creative edge if anybody you have got you. You know what I would suggest is that extroverts do a deep dive into what their strengths are, and uh, I love Martin Segelman's VIA Signature Strengths. If you Google VIA Signature Strengths, you will find a 240 uh, questionnaire, which your top five strengths will come up. Extroverts need to be expressing out in the world, so find your top three strengths and find ways for you to be expressive. Be that person on your uh, street that wears a crazy outfit and entertains the children from a distance. Be that person that dresses up in a gown and goes out into the local park and pits, picks up garbage. Be that local person that goes outside and spreads all kinds of goofy things outside in your window and your in, on your porch because you're wanting we extroverts, we love attention. So create that attention in some creative ways. And if you don't have ideas for it, just Google creative ways to be in the neighborhood or something like that on Google. And it will give you the answer of some ways that you can um, be extroverted. I have a, a, a friend who has, she's a young, interesting friend who just got laid off of uh, the college here. And she asked, 42 people to give her a schedule for a day to mm -hmm. live to live a day and she's going to be putting them all up on youtube and she's a bit of a she's a bit of a, an extrovert but she's now got 42 people interested in her day because <laughs> i wrote her a schedule and i can hardly wait to see if she did the recipe that i said i'd like her to do and and to see if she could compose a song but she said some of the days are like absolutely creative and amazing. And so she's got this troop of people, 42 people that have created a day for her. So they're following along. That's fine. So if you're an extrovert that doesn't have any creative juice, I know because you have a huge social network, you've got other creative people in your life. So ask them, hey, how can we zip up this connection with one another and make our days meaningfully Meaningfully fun, perhaps. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Now, here's something that uh, Judy was putting uh, up when we were talking about, uh, you know, connecting now on video. Are seeing people's eyes enough to connect? That's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. I am. I can see my mother with soft eyes. She's not here anymore. I think the seeing comes from inside. So does your heart, does your heart see? Yes. Yeah. So seeing with soft eyes. Uh, and I'm not just, I know that the, the line, the eyes are the a window to the soul. Mm -hmm. Some people find that uh, looking into their eyes invasive, especially if they've been invaded or wounded 
in their uh, history. And so I usually often look with soft eyes just below the eye in the spatial area. There's much to pay attention to in other people. Sometimes I end up paying attention to people's fidgety feet and speaking to that part of them that's asking for attention. I hope that answered your question. Well, I, I think, Sue, she was talking about, you know, when we connect in video, because imagine if this had happened 20 years ago. I mean, we would just have been really on the phone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and it, it would have been very different. I find their friends, you know, our friends in, in the speaker social, I have many friends around the world in South Africa, in Singapore, in Malaysia, who we, I only see once a year or less yeah. live in person. Yeah, yeah. But we're always in touch through Zoom. And uh, so to actually sit face to face is a wonderful gift when someone's on the other side of the world. And I find you can really connect. Yeah, yeah. there is, there is uh, a practice of looking as often as you can into the camera or mm -hmm. in my case, a webcam. Yes. And, yeah, because I could end up looking at at you, Ravi, and and not paying attention to the camera, and just and, and also kind of looking at myself, which is <laughs> and and that's the thing too. I was just chatting with someone about this that that you've got you know there is this thing that if you're looking at the person while you're talking, you're actually not looking in the camera. You're right. looking at them. It was just slight, and in this some cases slightly off. In others, it can be a lot, right? That's such as you say, at different speeds. So that is a little disconcerting. Yeah, because I'm looking like I'm looking, but I'm not really looking at you, which is quite, yeah. the, quite the, the paradox. So when I'm doing online counseling, and maybe that's where um, she was coming from, when I'm doing online counseling, um, I have people do a lot of going inside and doing introspection and noticing um, where they have sensations in their body and any uh flashbacks that are coming up, any thoughts that are disturbing them. And so then I'm like hyper vigilant watching the screen, not not making the uh, trying to make the eye contact, right? But then when they when they come back on and they need to know that I'm present to them, then I make an effort to look into the camera with a nodding, reassuring uh, presence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, this is another interesting thing that uh, Judy asked. Once we get back out to connect when we're all wearing, if we're all wearing masks, that's a really, I mean, my, my, the thing I'm wondering is, you know, sometimes I'm not going to be able to recognize people. Well, that, that, that will be interesting, won't it? Yeah. Right. Well, I think we need to just stay authentic with our own needs while following recommendations from our health region yeah yeah it is quite the dance it's been hasn't it been interesting to watch us be like obedient children and some mm -hmm. some of the population are having a real problem with that yeah so now if if we start moving into some of the deeper emotional challenges, such as happening right now in Nova Scotia for many people. We're dealing with, you know, working with how do we deal with this when most people know probably at least a, a one person who was killed. Uh, I, so far, there, there have been names coming out a lot. Of, for me, I think it's one. Uh, how can we start to grieve this to 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 work through our sadness when we are not able to to connect because normally we would you know if we're upset like this like i remember back at 911 what did we do our families we got together and we hugged and we you know consoled each other the now we don't have that option in a lot of cases there's some some people who are isolating with immediate family, but then there are others who aren't. So right. so what are your thoughts about that, about how we can actually work through some of that? Well, first of all, I am dumbfounded with what happened in your community. Uh, horrendous, that's the word that comes up. So if you are feeling crazy, if you're feeling crazy, 
I think that's almost appropriate for a crazy situation. You've got whatever stress you had in your life already, then you had the coronavirus, and then you had this awful, fearful, dreadful event happen. And I am quite sure that there are a number of people whose stress bucket is absolutely in overflow. So what do you do when you are in a situation that is so unusual and so horrific? You accept or face that it is so. You're not crazy. It is. Uh, it will be a marker on your life forever. And you will be changed. You will not be the same. And I want you to know, you are creative you're resourceful, and you're resilient. You've done hard things before, and this may be, for you, the hardest ever. So we're not minimizing that. What can you do? It's cliche again, but please up your self-care. Reach out. Talk as much as you can. Maybe even force yourself to talk to those who can provide a listening ear. Please have at least one person that you know, and maybe it's somebody that's um, not even in Nova Scotia, one person that you can talk to who, who can be present and not get wrapped up in the emotions themselves. It's sort of like, I have this image of many people trying to stay afloat, um, in your province and reach out to people who are on dry land that aren't struggling because we don't want you drowning you're too important your presence on this planet is needed we need you to survive and thrive and the rest of us our hearts are going out to you did that answer your question Robbie well that's <laughs> I mean I, I think a, a key point there that you had is the the reaching out because so many people hold us hold things in or try to be so strong that they should be able to handle this right well, I have another call and that is if you are not living in this uh, soup this almost war zone uh, Nova Scotia and you know somebody there reach out reach out and just say I'm thinking about you or reach out and say I'm going to call you again in four days I didn't get hold of you if you end up with a voice message don't rely on people to reach out because they may not mm -hmm. be in a mental health uh, condition to be able to do that so the rest of us if we have any connection is to call call now call soon and let them know you care. And don't be prod, prodding too much. Um, let people know that you're thinking about them and you care about them. And if they want to talk, I have the best line on the planet. If somebody does say something and you want them to feel supported, just say, tell me more. And if they say, I don't wanna talk about it, then honor that. There's a time and a place, everybody grieves differently. Some people express their grief through anger, some through sadness, through depression, uh, denial. There's all kinds of, um, well, used, Elizabeth Kluber Ross used to talk about it as in steps, but the steps are different for, for everybody. Honor one another's process of grieving and honor your own. Set your own boundaries and be as authentic as you can, right? That's why I want each person to have at least one person that they feel emotionally safe with. That's yeah. my desire for you. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, to reach out at the very least to a family, a friend, mm -hmm. but there's also, you can just Google the crisis line uh, for Nova Scotia and such. It's, it's easily accessible to, to do, to make sure, especially now with the isolation, now here's, uh, and I, this is again where I'm going to ask if there are people who are in the midst of this uh, and you've got specific questions for, for Patricia, please put them into 
the uh, into the comments so that we can ask. And this is one that Judy is bringing in. How do we find purpose and meaning at the prospects of being a solo person, no pets, without an outdoor space for weeks or months or a year? Because uh, here in Nova Scotia, our parks and our beaches are closed. So the only thing we can do is take walks in our neighborhood. The, the, the basically, we're supposed to just stay home except for walks for exercise in the neighborhood and uh, you know, trip to the grocery store once a week. So especially for people who are alone, how can they find support moving forward through this? Ah, thank you for asking, Judy. One of the people I'm supporting is a person who is just coming out of depression before the coronavirus hit, a single woman. And she's been sending me every day. I, I will share with you. Um, it's from Sean Anker's work on authentic happiness. Here are uh, five practices. Um, so number one is uh, meditate for at least two minutes a day. Exercise for at least 10 minutes a day. Send an email or phone somebody and tell them the best event of your day, which in some ways forces you to pay attention to what is the best event that happened to you today. And it might have been that you love the taste of your toothpaste and your teeth ended up being quite shiny. It really doesn't matter. Then to email or keep in a journal three to five gratitudes that you have a day. And last but not least is for you to reach out to somebody you know needs or would benefit from hearing some appreciation from you or an encouragement from you. And I would go back to Martin Segelman's inventory of strengths. And I've been encouraging also people to know their strengths, top ones that come up, and then every day do an activity that demonstrates that strength. Leave, make muffins and leave them on the porch of a neighbor. It doesn't even matter if you know the neighbor. You could just put a little note on saying, hope you enjoy. I want you each day to think about what you can do to make the world a better place. Smiling. We don't have the masks on yet here, um, but if you can smile out your window, wave, sing, hum, dance, you make the world a better place. There was a young man who was on the way to the pharmacy to buy the means to commit suicide, to uh, end his life. And a woman rolled down her window and she smiled and she waved at him and she said, young man, I hope you make yourself an amazing day. And she drove off and that young man changed his mind. We have an incredible influence on one another in the way we behave and the way we act. Blessings to you to wanting to be on purpose. Here is my definition of living on purpose. Know your gifts and give what you can. And again, Martin Sigelman provides a little bit of insight into what your innate gifts might be. That is beautiful. And it's funny, it's interesting that you start off that list uh, with the meditation, because I know for myself, if I didn't have that, I would be, you know, that's blood up. Uh, and, and I listen to that call when I feel that in there, it's like, okay, I have to go sit. And, you know, at least for 20 minutes, but there's some days where it may be an hour or even an hour and a half or two hours, but it's, I, I'm calling for that and, and, and listening to that. And, and if it wasn't for that, truly, that's my lifeline, I think. Well, good on you. Even, yeah. two, even two minutes to settle into self. So yeah. there, there's the external world, which we have been primarily programmed to pay attention to. What's going on in the external world and what can we bring in to validate who we are. I get so excited about people spending 
some time in the inner world. It's as big and large and complicated and exciting and creative and fascinating as outside world. And how many people are investing time and money and focus on the internal world? Meditation is one of the ways, simple, economical, no cost ways to go inside and be with self. And uh, Michelle is just uh, expressing her gratitude for your thoughts, Patricia. Well, hi, Michelle. <laughs> so the, the other thing that, that I found that, that that's interesting, I love, you know, you had the gratitude journal there, but you, I love that thing about connecting with someone to share what was the highlight of the day. And even if it was little, like that's one thing when, you know, when I work with clients on a gratitude journal, it's like, it doesn't have to be big and some days are like those days and and you know the best you can say is i'm grateful i was breathing and but that's still something <laughs> well you know it'd be great to have a, a grateful uh face off so <laughs> i can't tell you how exciting it was for me today like the highlight of my day here in calgary was to watch my husband go upstairs to the second floor carrying a vacuum cleaner and then to hear it being turned on. I was dancing, just dancing. He's vacuuming. I have a house husband. Yeah. <laughs> you have him well trained. So now, so definitely, we, you know, I love those lists that you, you identified, especially for you know, it is a challenge if you are alone, right? Because there's, if you've got your children there and such, yes, it's a lot of pressure. And yet you've got that contact, you've got that someone you can hold, right? Yeah. Uh, so it can, you know, there's challenges on both sides. You've got the pressure of looking after the kids versus the solitude and such. The, um, the other thing is now with, what are other options for us coming back to what's going on here what are other options to going uh to working through this when we can't go to others for solace uh other thoughts on that i mean there, there's been some amazing creative things online but we really need to make sure that we're properly working through and healing that that grief and the sadness right first of first of all is to look after your basic needs. Um, I get concerned when people are not looking after their sleep, mm -hmm. their need for movement, exercise, and proper diet. So that's a, a red a red flag. So take care of basic needs so that you can be present for yourself and for others. Uh, up your self-compassion, let yourself off the hook. Um, what else can you do for yourself? Uh, I was going to suggest that you go online and watch videotapes from people such as Eckhart Tolle, mm -hmm. Brene Brown, some of those people that have huge compassion and have done a lot of their own uh, inner, inner work, as well as um, make sure you, you are nourishing your brain uh, with music. Be discerning about the music you're listening to, the words that you're listening to, as well as um, what you're taking in about the news. Uh, keep that to a minimum. Mm -hmm. Right. So maybe you, you want to stay informed as to what's going on, but you don't want to be poisoning and creating fear, fear, unnecessary fear by drowning in it. Um, and reading. No, your fav favorite book. If you're a writer, this is a wonderful time to be writing. Uh, some Sometimes journaling works really, really well for people and other times not. Uh, maybe it's a good time for you to make a list of all your accomplishments. If you're starting to have doubt, uh, writing down your accomplishments uh, and precisely numbers. How many people you have served or how much money you have made, whatever. Sorry, Patricia, we just lost you to how many what? We just lost you. Yeah, use numbers to make it concrete to your brain. Your left brain wants to see see numbers of how many people you've helped or how much money you made, whatever success means, means for you. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. And the uh, last one is make yourself a storyboard of your future. We need to believe that we have a future. We are optimistic beings and we need to be able to see a rainbow at the end of the storm. So I would recommend that everybody, whether you're picturing yourself having family dinner or whether it's going to Mexico, I don't care what it is, that will help you get through the storm to have something that you are looking. Mine, my picture that I have, is a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old that I miss, like you wouldn't believe that yeah. hugging and squeezing and saying, oh, Grammy, you're the best Grammy we have. That's what I'm picturing. So make your picture. It's having something to look forward to. Yeah. Yeah. The storm yeah. Is big and thick, yeah. The other thing, and again, folks, jot your questions down if you've got specific things that you're, you're working through or having challenges with it's it's a, it's really taking a look at what you take on yourself or what you let get to you because there there can be such tiny little things like is you know i wouldn't in this day and age since the the pandemic i wouldn't normally wear a sports jacket but we got conflicting messages today the rcmp said we're red and then the premier of our province says we're blue or the Nova Scotia tart. So what do you do? <laughs> so I've got my red, I've got my blue, right? But but it's but it, it sounds stupid, but little things like that we actually do. Let's stress ourselves, don't we? Well, Ronnie, it's the stress bucket's already full. How can you how can you put another drop in? Yeah, it's tiny thing, but that's all it takes. Give yourself a break. The stress bucket is that's. It's drip, 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 drip. And what's happened is a big, huge dump. Yeah, and Christine's loving the idea of the storyboard of the future. Thank you, Christine, and hi. The, um, so with that stress bucket, I guess the, the thing that comes to mind is how can we start to empty it? Right. So uh, people, some people are walking around with a whole bunch of stress, trauma from their childhood. There is a, those are some of those people that I was saying, here's an opportunity. Every time I start to get in the car, I start to have a panic attack. Oh, I have this time to do this and I can empty, my, empty some of my stress bucket. And then other people don't have that privilege, such, such as the nurse I'm working with. We are not spending a lot of time in the childhood stress bucket or past issues we're trying to keep the stress bucket from not filling right so who are you spending time with what do you what kind of ritual are you putting in place that keeps you getting good sleep good nutrition exercise what routines are you putting in to um, minimize stressing yourself in those ways who are you hanging out with this is a time to to know the calmest most rational uh caring compassionate accepting unconditionally loving people in your life and uh bring them closer whether it's over the phones zoom um or in my neighborhood, sometimes we have these wonderful chats standing on either side of the road, yelling at one another from the sidewalk. Get get creative. And it's not selfish. Some people are feeling selfish right now. Uh, I say, if you're not centered in self, who are you centered in? And my favorite all-time quotation, Ravi, I think is so useful in this time of crisis. It's by the philosopher Hillel. It goes like this. If I am not for me, who will be? Mm -hmm. Please pay attention to that. All those people that are living alone and those moms that are running businesses and have employees. And now they're being, well, and sometimes it's, a, hopefully it's also the dad running businesses. And now they're having to be teachers as well as caregivers, as well as still running their business. Um, so if I'm not for me, who will be? And the second part of it is, if I'm only for me, what is the point? Which Judy brought up about purpose. Mm -hmm. 
And it doesn't matter what you do. It could be those muffins on somebody's porch or it could be calling a senior that you know or somebody that we know in, in uh, Halifax that we know might have, be experiencing this ripple effect, which you actually said wasn't a ripple effect. It was like a, what was it, like a tsunami? It really, yeah. This last week, honestly, because it, the scale of it yeah. is devastating. And again, you know, it's interesting. It's the uncertainty because things there was nothing definite they we didn't really get a clear timeline until today what's this friday and it happened saturday sunday and so this uncertainty and every day there was the the death toll went up uh and it's just and and there's this fear and it's just like i mentioned to you just before i came on a bunch of people messaged me that uh, uh released by the rcmp that apparently the shots fired five miles from me uh, and now I don't know if it's shots. I don't know what's the, but everyone is so on edge. Right. So Robbie, right now, I want you to feel your feet and take a big breath, will you? <laughs> no, I'm serious. Feel your feet, take a big breath, and just kind of let yourself sink in a little bit, and just notice. If you were a little kid, what would you be feeling? Huh. At this time, with that information, mm -hmm. a kid would be scared. I'm scared. Then that's real. Mm -hmm. That's real. Mm -hmm. I'm, so, also imagine, I'm also imagining powerless. Yeah. I'm also imagining maybe uh, some frustration. Yeah. yeah don't know and don't know what's happening don't understand it you know the, the, right so so confusion helplessness yeah helplessness, yeah so this is an interesting aspect about about feelings that may um help listeners when they're interacting with other people um when we um, deny a feeling it gets bigger mm -hmm. you ever I, I don't well i've been told don't cry and that all that happens the crying gets louder and bigger and uglier. It does. Right. <laughs> or um, don't feel afraid. And all it does is make, make it bigger. And if you keep pushing the feeling away, if somebody else is trying to do it or you're trying to do it in your own, your own head, it often ends up in anger. Because we long to be seen, heard, and acknowledged. Mm -hmm. We long to have who we truly are be okay. And the only way to get that is to be real with our what's going on for us inside and to have it seen, heard, and acknowledged. Now, I want to compliment you for publicly just doing that little demonstration. And the other interesting part around once we see, hear, acknowledge a feeling is it calms. Are you feeling mm -hmm. different than when we just started that conversation? Yeah, and I mean, I had done some of that, set something similar to that before even coming on. Like once I saw that, it's like, okay, need to yeah. allow that through before coming on here. You know, you have to do your work before. <laughs> right? The feelings can actually um, take over brain. Yeah, power. right. So the one this is an interesting point maybe to start to pull this together. Judy's uh, asking, how about when we re-enter life, quote, unquote? And I, again, that's going to be a thing. We we may come out of lockdown, but we still will have to be social distancing, right? But how do we re-enter when restrictions are, and, and I'm not sure what you mean by restrictions lifted, because that's going to come in phases. It may be two or three years before we go back to the full freedoms we had before, uh, you know, by the time things but and again it's unknown but she's saying i feel i may be losing the ability to cope with day-to-day -day events and people yeah and so so true don't you think that's so true uh i remember being uh moving to calgary from living in ontario for most of my life i was 40 we moved here and i didn't get employment for three months and i started to question whether i mm. had any capacity any skills any knowledge, any anything. So mm -hmm. 
forget that we develop habits and rituals, not only thinking yeah. and behaving, right? And during this time, we've had to have huge adjustments. So it'll be a, another adjustment. Any change, by the way, requires energy yeah. and, and is exhausting. And when we, when we are uh, required to have a number of changes, uh, we need to be easy on ourselves. So any new jobs I've had, I've always said, give myself three months to be mm -hmm. exhausted, to absolutely exhausted and not be able to give all that much to my family because I'm busy on a high learning curve and, and change. And it will be for us again, another shift, another change that will require time, energy and focus. But well, I like to end with some good news. This opportunity to do the introspection i think most of us or many of us will re-enter the world being clearer about our gifts you're asking that question back a ways judy about your gifts we will be re-entering with more of a sense of who we are what we want we're questioning what's important. Is toilet paper that important? Is a big paycheck that important? Is an iPhone that important? Or are my loved ones that important? Yeah. So I think, we'll, we'll, yes, we'll be re-entering. And I think we'll find that we are re-entering many of us as more of who we really are. And not what we think others think we should be or we think others think we should be in and so forth i agree i think we're we're being forced into a lot of introspection so we become more self-aware yes yes and for some people that's really scary do they really do i really like myself i tell you some days i don't like myself right and and uh then i then i gotta go okay whose voice is that and come back to basically we are all born lovable if dogs and cats can be born lovable, well, darn it, so can we as human, <laughs> human beings. So lovableness is a given, and capableness has to do with using our gifts on purpose. And we all, I have uh, a daughter and grandkids with disabilities, and uh, we, found, we found their gifts. We all have a gift. Um, regardless of our situation, and, it's, uh, and we have the choice to use it or not. So Patricia, where uh, can people, you know, get in touch with you? I'm putting your website up there. Uh, where, how can people find out more about what you do and uh, and your resources? Well, that's a great place to start. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So my contact information is on there. If you go to my website, then you can send me an email. I'm very open. If anybody has anything you think I'm on purpose, I really feel like. I'm on purpose. So if I can be supportive and helpful to you at this time, I'm, I do have space because I'm uh, also a caregiver to my daughter and grandkids and they're locked up in a different house. So I had, I do have some space there. Um, again, my heart goes out to you, Robbie, and your community. And um, I'm so, I'm so glad they have you as a leader. Yes, you, 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 you model what I'm talking about. So thank you for doing it. And thank you for making the time to be, uh, to be with us. Because I, you know, we had talked about doing this before this happened, I think. And then I, I was just sensing into the energy and I was feeling, no, there's, there's, there's a need now to bring more because we we were talking about doing it in relation to the pandemic in general and what people were coming and then this happened and, and i think it was just yesterday i said no we need it i feel it's needed now and and thank you for making the space for this truly truly appreciate it I miss you so much well, let's do a, a virtual hug before we <laughs> bye bye my dear mm. oh. <laughs> Thank you. And I've got CC with me. So <laughs> now the other thing too, I should mention again, this, this resource I'm about to mention is not for if you are dealing with other mental health challenges that you were, you know, working through before with professional help that you still need the, the, the professional support for that. 
But for most of us who are having this general sort of ongoing anxiety or the uncertainty with this, my friend Christopher Bauer and I, who you know, Chris, Patricia, um, he, uh, out of Nashville, he and I have been putting together over the last while a new program, totally free for people out there. It's called 21 Days to Serenity. It's about how do we step out of defuse that anxiety to be able to find that space to breathe with tiny, tiny little exercises every day, minutes, but to build the habits. And uh, you can get access to that, it's totally free at uh, getridofthestress.com. And uh, you, you'll be able to get that right away. So please feel free to pass that on to anyone you feel uh, would be able to to use that. Please uh, take advantage of it yourself. Uh, it's it's uh, Chris and I are really really um, excited about the the package of resources that 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 we put together there. So please reach out and. You know, be gentle on yourself, especially those of you impacted here in Nova Scotia and elsewhere with what has happened this last week. Reach out to friends, to family, to, uh, you know, to the crisis hotline, whatever you need to. This is not a time to work through this alone. And I love what you said, Patricia, that if there are people out there who know people impacted by, by this, who know people in Nova Scotia, to uh, to to call them and, and be persistent about it. I think that's a wonderful, wonderful uh, idea. So thank you all, and thank you for uh, joining us. Um, Christine is uh, saying this was an awesome session. We're a dynamic duo. I'll be Robin. You can be back. <laughs> Okay. Thank you all. We will see you. Uh, see you soon. Bye bye. And